Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'll have the um, presentation in English uh, so that um, some of the people that are invited to join us online uh, can also follow. And um, because I didn't want to read out the long title, uh, I decided uh, that we should go for a shorter one, uh, which is Big Data for Charging Stations. And um, why think about it? Um, so what you're about to see is almost like a time lapse of five years of looking into charging stations, of looking into electromobility. Electromobility has been very different in 2018 when we started doing this. Um, cars weren't very common. You would probably, in this room, probably everybody knows at least one person who owns an electric vehicle. Back then, that was not definitely not the case. Um, and charging stations are essential. And we want to look into why and how and how, what we can do about that. And before we start with the details, before we dive in and, and, and go into the, the machine learning and math and everything, uh, I want to quickly start with the key motivation, which is uh, climate change. Um, so climate change, big problem. We want to avoid it. To avoid it, we need to reduce CO2 emissions. To reduce CO2 emissions, every sector needs to um, bring in their own contribution. And if we look at Germany in this case, um, there would be here the emissions from 1990 to 2021, I think. Um, we can see that that worked reasonably well, uh, maybe not, not as quick as we wanted to, but we have seen a reduction by 500 million tons. The problem is that we don't see that in traffic. So if you look at the yellow bars on the bottom, you see that they're about the same size. Um, so the sh emissions generated from traffic have not reduced practically at all over the last 30 years. And that's a huge problem. And that also means that if you reduce the overall amount of emissions, then traffic becomes more pressing because the share of the overall emissions um, rises as the, um, sorry, the share of traffic rises as the overall emissions go down. And to do that, to achieve that, there's many ways and um, there's modal shifts. So you want to move more into buses, trains, uh, you want to ride your bicycle and you should do all that and we have to do all that. Um, but when we do that, we also need to make sure that the vehicles that we're still using, and I believe that we will be using electric vehicle or vehicles, cars in the future as well, we need to make sure that uh, when, we, when we do that, we do that as sustainably as possible. And in that, electric vehicles are the only technology, I believe, that is able to deliver at the required speed and quantity. To have electric vehicles, um, you need charging stations. Um, public charging stations, there, there's two things. If you ask people, would you buy an electric vehicle? And if they say no, they'll typically say there's two reasons. One is they have range anxiety. Personal opinion is that the number of people who want to go nonstop to Italy has dramatically increased since we uh, sell electric vehicles. Um, but the other one is public charging stations. And that's something that we can do about it. Um, because people want to have the sort of certainty that if they ride their electric vehicle, that they will find a public charging station available. And uh, we've been relatively successful in the, in the 2010s with that. Uh, we had a ratio about, of about 10 vehicles per charging station. And that, that was for a long time uh, something where we thought like, hey, that's, that's a good ratio. The problem was, problem um, of sorts, is that since 2020, um, the electric vehicles have really taken off. The number of electric vehicles on the road has increase, increased dramatically. Um, the cumulative annual growth rate, CAGR, um, has been about 100% year on year. So we've doubled the number of electric vehicles per year. That has slowed down a little bit in 2023, um, but we're still growing at an almost exponential pace. It's going up dramatically quickly, and we haven't seen the same thing happen from charging points. So the number of charging points has more or less increased linearly. We'll see a few reasons on why that happened, um, but that poses a problem. Because while we had um, about 10 vehicles per charging point for a long period of time, or even less than that, um, that number has gone up to 23.3 um, in 2022. That, so that means more than two times as many vehicles need to share a single charging station. Um, and that's in itself a challenge, not per se a problem, that's solvable. But to solve it, we need to be more intelligent than just plastering the streets with charging stations. We need to think about ways to deal with it. And there is some things that can help us. Um, so one thing that definitely helps us is that the battery energy has gone up dramatically. So if you, what you see here on the slide is the battery energy, and think of it as range, um, for vehicles sold per year. And what we see is that in 2018, we still had um, just under 30 kilowatt hours on, in the average car. 
um, which is not going to get you very far. Um, and then in 2022, we've seen that number shoot up to just under 60 kilowatt hours, and that is going to give you about 300 kilometers of range on average. So there's cars that have even longer range. And what that means is that if you go 40 kilometers per day, um, that you'll get through a whole week on a single charge. And for charging infrastructure in turn, that means uh, because you don't need as many charge events, uh, you can concentrate stuff more and you can and be more efficient in your usage. You don't need to go as often because if you go very frequently, there's a higher chance of inefficiency. The other thing that helps us is higher charging power. Um, so nowadays, if you buy an electric vehicle, a battery electric vehicle, you practically always get a DC charging port. That wasn't the case a few years back. And if you get the DC charging port, you get fast charging on average, just over 100 kilowatts uh, peak charging power. But good news, um, what is a bit challenging is that the AC charging power hasn't gone up. Um, so typically, um, if you buy an electric vehicle, it will have 11 kilowatt of charging power. There's still a few with 7.4 or 3.7 kilowatts. Um, so here, the charging power hasn't gone up. And so, but, but this gives us a framework to, in, in which we can think. And just as a last part of the motivation to motivate why this is relevant, uh, why we need to get this right. What you see here on the screen is the batteries in Germany. So that's all the batteries, except for portable devices, that we have all the lithium batteries mostly. And what we see in yellow, red, and pink are the stationary batteries. So that's all the batteries that we have in PV home storages, that will, that's what we have sort of to buffer electricity um, and the like. And we see that those are about 7.5 gigawatt hours by the end of 2022. That's a large number. That's impressive given the fact that lithium batteries have been on the market for maybe 30 years. Um, that's a huge number. But if we compare that to electric vehicles, that number appears almost tiny. Um, in electric vehicles, by the end of 2022, uh, we had about 65 gigawatt hours of battery energy. But that number has since gone up to about 85-ish uh, gigawatt hours. Just for reference, all pumped hydro storage, uh, pumped hydro, not hydrogen, pumped hydro uh, storages in Germany, which are the classical flexibility in the grid, uh, reach to about 40 gigawatt hours. So we already have two times as much energy capacity in cars as we have in anything else. And that means that we need to get this right. We need to make sure that this energy is used in the right way, that it is system friendly, um, and that this ultimately helps us decarbonize using green electricity. Right, from this motivation, from this introduction, there's a few things that we want to know, or that I want to know. Um, because we've seen less charge points per car, we need more and more charge points that share a single, uh, sorry, more and more vehicles that share single charge points, so we need to make sure that we run the whole thing as intelligent as, and as efficient as possible, while still not reducing user comfort. And to do that, there's three things that we want to learn. The first one is we need to know how public charging stations are currently used. If you don't know what's the problem, you can't find a solution. Um, the second one is we want to be able to predict utilization. Why do we want to do that? We want to make sure that if there is a high chance that you won't find a charging opportunity, that we can look for alternatives for you, that your navigation system can already think ahead and make sure that you find your recharging opportunity, even if it get, it's getting crowded. Um, just to not reduce user comfort here. And the third one is, if we only have very few charging stations, if we build a new one, we should make sure that we place them as efficiently and as well as we can. So those are the three questions that I think we need to answer to improve this whole situation. And if we get this right, we can serve all the electric vehicles that we have right now, and we'll be fine with the number of charging stations. All right. Um, I said on the second slide that this is going to be big data for charging stations. Um, so I will have to, or you will have to allow me one slide on data uh, that was being used, and then we'll look a little bit at what we can learn from that data. So what do we use? Um, there's a bunch of data, but those are the two most important data sets. One thing is uh, called uh, status data. So status data is something that we know for practically every public charging station in Germany. All the slides or and all the data that or all the analysis that you will see is 2019 to 2021. Um, but we have that running up until now. We know for every public charging station when it became occupied, when it was available, and every now and then we have a problem with um, internet connectivity, and then we have the status unknown. So we know that for each single charging point. 
I try to have as few abbreviations as possible. One of them is in here, EVS EID, um, stands for Electric Vehicle Supply Equipment. Think of it as a charge point, so that's one point where you can supply an electric vehicle. That's where the name comes from. That's one th set. The other one is the charge detail records. The charge detail records are similar, just that here we're focusing on a single charging station and we get a few pieces of information. The most relevant ones in our situation, for our purposes now for this presentation, are when did it start, when did it end. Those two are what we could also get from the status information, so they are kind of duplicate. Um, but we also see the energy that was transferred uh, per charging station. And that is something um, that is very valuable that wasn't available in the scales and in the representativeness um, that I will show today in the presentation. Um, for this data and for a lot of other stuff, I already want to say a big thanks to Smart Limit Object who uh, provided us with the data and who've been uh, with us um, for a couple of years now and who've been really, really helpful. All right, so what do we do with this data? Um, so we have a large data, so what we need to do something with it. We want to create information from this amount of data. And one thing that we can do is the following. So we start with um, a charge detail record. In this case, we focus on 11 kilowatt charges. And we say we have one charge detail record, top one, um, that started at 10.46, ended at, at 12.43, so that's about two hours. And we've seen that uh, there was a bit over 20 kilowatt hours of energy consumed in that session. Um, the second point is analogous. analogous. Now, this is what we call a scatter plot. The problem is, if you do that with 9 million data points, you're just going to end up with a black surface. You're not going to see anything. Uh, because it's just going to look like this. Good luck trying to discern anything from that. What we can do instead to gain somewhat more information is uh, we can draw the following diagram. So what we do here is we draw shades of blue that indicate how many percent of points are below that line. So the top line that you see um, will be a 100% line. So that means those are sort of the maximum. No charging session uh, had a higher energy consumption for that period of time uh, than what we see here. And then we go down, the, the next shade of blue is 90%, 80%, etc. The red line is the median, so 50% of the charging session had more energy uh, consumed, 50% had less energy consumed um, for the red line. So that's what we can, we can think of that as sort of a typical uh, utilization. And that is already valuable information, because we see um, a knee point after two hours. And what does it mean? If I'm a charging point operator, a charge point operator, um, that means that if I have somebody at my station, I will sell most of my energy in the first two hours. So the first two hours are what, when people are actually still charging. That's when the energy per unit of time is going up quickly. After that, it slows down. It's, it's still going up a little bit, um, but definitely after about four hours, we see no increase in energy anymore. And uh, that means that if somebody stays at your charging station for four hours, or if they stay at your charging station for 10 hours, you're not going to sell more energy, you're not going to make any more money. And charging, charge point operators know this, um, that's why you typically pay a blocking fee after four hours. So if you leave your vehicle longer than that, uh, you need to pay extra because you're not going to consume any energy. And the third thing that we can see is the 11 kilowatt line. Now, very simple, if you have a charging station that is able to, 11, to deliver 11 kilowatts, and you were at that station for four hours and you would be consuming energy with full power for those four hours, then you would, be expect, you would expect to end up with uh, at about 44 kilowatt hours. Simple math. And that's what we do. So the 11 kilowatt line is there. It's clearly visible. Um, we can see that after four hours, we are at about 44 kilowatt hours. The problem is very few people do that. So if you look at this, uh, you can see that practically nobody actually uses the full power of the charging stations. And there's many reasons for that. I've shown before that on average, cars have a lower charging power than that. There is uh, vehicles filling up. So if you come to the station with a very high state of energy of your battery, uh, then you're only gonna charge for a short period of time and maybe that with a low power. Um, so relatively inefficient use of assets here. And we can transfer that idea to other power levels. So if we take a 3.7 and a 22 kilowatt charger. Now, for those of you who are, that aren't too familiar with electric vehicles, 3.7 is a bit more than what you get out of your um, socket at your home. Um, if you go camping, that's the blue sockets that gives you about um, 3.7 kilowatts. And 22 kilowatts, which is the right plot, is 
more or less the standard if you go out in the public, if you have a public charging station, they're typically 22 kilowatt stations. And what do we see? We see the same knee point again. And that is not surprising um, because I've shown before that cars aren't able to consume more than 11 kilowatts. So even if the station is able to offer more, the car can't consume anything. Um, so we still end up with the same profile. We see the knee point after two hours, we see the no increase after four hours, and we actually end up with the same energy level. We end up with about 11 kilowatt hours uh, in the median. Um, interestingly, we see the same four hour um, sort of cap uh, for 3.7 kilowatt uh, chargers. Again, because batteries are filling up, we're ending up with about 11 kilowatt hours recharged. And interestingly, similar pattern, here we see the 22 kilowatt line as before with the 11 kilowatt charger. But if we now plot the 11 kilowatt line, we see that even here, even if I have a 22 kilowatt charger, um, if, I only, if people are only going to consume 11 kilowatts, I don't need a grid capacity that's as large. So if I have maybe 10 charge points, I don't need 10 times 22 kilowatt of grid connection power. I will be, be perfectly fine uh, with half, than that, uh, half of that, probably even less. So that's for charge point operators, that's one of the things that the industry is actually very interested in to see these, these ways of looking at data that can tell you how to operate, how to build charging stations, where efficiencies and inefficiencies lie. Another way to look at it uh, would be the following. Um, so this plot is generated using the occupation data that I've shown before. So yes, available, occupied, unknown. And a way to read this plot is to um, look at one specific point. So the green line, that's our 22 kilowatt charges again, those are the ones that I said are very frequent out in the public. And the point that I highlighted is midday, Tuesday. And the way to read this was, is that between 2019 and 2021, about 10% of the 22 kilowatt charges were occupied on the typical Tuesday midday. So that's the way to read this. And there's a few things to see from this. Um, we can see a clear daytime nighttime pattern and we can see a clear weekday weekend pattern. Um, daytime nighttime, during the day there's more people, during the night there's fewer, and on weekends there's generally fewer utilization on the upper curves, so there would be our 11 kilowatt, that was the one that I showed first, green one, the 22 kilowatt, and blue one, um, the, the, those are the 3.7 kilowatts, they are not used very frequently, so sort of ignore those a little bit. We see the opposite behavior at fast chargers, because we see that the brown and purple line actually go a bit up on the weekend, and that is commuters. So people driving longer distances on the weekend um, make sense Friday afternoon uh, through Sunday midday, uh, you see increased usage. The thing is, if we want to think about intelligent systems, um, we want to think mostly about the slower ones, about the lower powers, simply because if you're on the highway and if you're driving, you're not going to say like, hey, fine, I'll come back next week. Um, you're on the highway, you need to recharge because you need to go somewhere. Um, with the slower ones, you have the flexibility because I said before, you can go through a whole week uh, without um, needing or with a single charge on average. So if you're a charge point operator, if you want to make your people so if you want to sell more energy or if you want to deliver energy to more people, you want to try to have more charging operations at night and you want to have more charging operations on the weekend. Another way to split the data is not to go by power level, but to go by where they're located. And we use the categories urban, suburban, industrial, and uninhabited. So that, that's sort of the general area where those charges are located. And um, there's a few patterns again that we can see. In industrial areas, people come in the morning, um, the, the curve shoots up, and then after people have finished working, um, the curve goes down again. For suburban areas, we don't quite see the same thing. We see more of a plateau, kind of, um, which is some people coming in in the morning, but also people coming in in the evening, and that kind of balances each other out and leads to that plateau. Urban areas are the most attractive um, because you have many customer groups, overall higher population density, which leads to higher utilization. If you're a charge point operator, you want to have more charging in suburban or industrial areas because that's where you have capacity. Uninhabited in this case is a bit out because there's special circumstances around these um, that I don't want to go into right now. And the last one, um, and then I'll be finished with the, the, the colorful plots, uh, is this one. The idea is very similar to the first plot that I've shown with the shades of blue, uh, just that in this case uh, we are taking the average. So 
almost like the red line before. Uh, we're ta just taking the average of all those charging events and plotting that. And, what that. and there's a few things that we can learn from this. So one is, and remember we are 2019 to 2021, battery capacities were on average about 50 kilowatt hours, about. Um, and on a fast charger, we deliver 40 kilowatt hours, which is great. Those are full charges. Assuming that you're not going to get there with a fully em a completely empty battery and assuming that you're not going to depart uh, with 100%, but maybe 80 or 90%, that's when charging is faster, that's a full charge. Awesome. Perfect. That's exactly what we want. People come, charge, leave. Ideal. Um, we don't see that for the slow chargers. Uh, we see that if we look at the green curve, which, is, which are our 22 kilowatt chargers uh, that we've um, had on our journey, we see that that curve on average never goes higher than 20. So even if people are for a very long period of time at the charging station, on average they don't fully charge. Um, there is a bit, there's plug-in hybrids and there's some cars with lower battery energy that reduce sort of the 40 kilowatt hours maybe to a bit less, but nevertheless at the end of the day public AC charging infrastructure is not always used for full charge and there's no real technical reason why they shouldn't. Um, it's just that people are plugging in with maybe almost full batteries um, and there's inefficient utilization and there's ways to counter that. Um, so one strategy is more fast charging. If you look at the market dynamic at the moment, the number of fast charging points is growing a lot. The number of AC slow charging points is not growing. Um, so people are moving into the fast charging segment because it's more attractive. Um, and the other one is you want to have more energy per charging event. And we'll see and we'll take a quick look at how you can do that. Um, so here I've, I've shown those five strategies um, before. How do you implement those? Um, so you can have discounted charging rates in certain times of days. So you, that's what we tried and it works. So if we give, if we charge people less, if they charge at night, we can see a notable increase in the number of people that charge at night. Uh, we can do blocking fee wafers. Uh, we've done that. Um, can't really tell the effect. Notifications, we haven't tried that. Uh, reduction of charging rates works really well. Um, so if you want to have your people charge more than a small amount of energy, what you do is you make the second part cheaper. So you make the first few kilowatt hours very expensive and then the rest reasonably cheap because that will motivate people to go less frequently because then in proportion they're getting overall uh, cheap electricity. Sounds complicated, people understand that and we can show and we've tried that in a field test here in Aachen um, that that works. All right, um, and I've already hinted at the number of AC charging stations going, is, isn't growing as quickly as it should be. Um, DC charging stations, they are. One of the things that you can do is you can compare what it typically costs um, to build a charging station per power level. And this is a very rough estimation because a lot depends on the local circumstances. But we just took one value for CAPEX and OPEX for all uh, power levels. And then you can assume a certain profitability. Uh, so you can say, how much money am I making per kilowatt hour of energy that I'm selling? And then we look at, because we know for all charging stations how they're being used, we look at how much energy they are selling. And then we can check, okay, how many of those stations, given a certain sales margin, would be able to recover their costs? And that's what we get here. Um, and the yellow ones are what, in the time period that we're looking at, was a typical value, in my opinion, and that is very subjective. You could argue that, for instance, the fast chargers had a lower profitability, um, but, you know, they are ballpark numbers uh, about right. The other highlighted cell color is um, the greenhouse gas emission trading quota. Um, for the ones that aren't very familiar with the business, it's essentially a subsidy scheme uh, where you pay extra on fuel, um, and that subsidy scheme is used to, comp or to subsidize um, other types of mobility, including electric vehicles. And if we look at those numbers, then even including that subsidy scheme, and we can't do that forever, only 33% or 31% um, of the slow charging stations are profitable. And here then it makes perfect sense that nobody wants to build them anymore. Not, not nobody, but the number of people building them has not grown in the same way that the number of vehicles has grown, as it should. We see that fast chargers are more profitable, but that is mostly because of um, the higher energy margin. The problem is if you always recharge at those fast chargers and if you have no other recharging opportunity, it's going to end up very expensive. You're going to end up spending a lot of money much more than, uh, not much more, but more than on a gasoline car. So this is not 
very attractive to always go to fast chargers, plus the battery doesn't like it, but Matthias will, will be the one who can explain you much better why a battery doesn't like fast charging. All right, um, so that's a few things that we can immediately see from the data. So we've, we've described a few problems, and now we'll try to solve them, um, as we do in science. Um, now, there's many ways in which you can look at utilization modeling. There's plenty of ways. There's, and what we've done for most of the time that charging stations have been an issue is we've used model-based um, ideas. So Standard Tool is probably the most famous one um, where they use 29 different data sets to estimate charging demand in certain areas. Um, and anybody who's ever worked with that quantity of data sets will, able, will be able to tell you that obtaining and maintaining that is challenging, it's a pain, um, it's super complicated, and you also have the problem that you're trying to match a purchasing power in an area to how much charging is going to happen. And there's ways to match those two, but it's always a bit shaky foundation. So you're always going to end up with a, you know, a bit of a guesstimate, good guesstimates, but guesstimates. So what you can do instead, if you want to just look at the near future, uh, you can uh, use data. Um, because data doesn't have that issue. Because you're using occupation and you want to predict occupation, there's no challenge in linking those two. And you typically need much fewer data sets. All I've shown you so far was built essentially on those two main data sets plus a bit of geographical data. Um, and it's very helpful if you can assume that the overall situation is not going to change, so you use it for short-term prediction. And the question that we want to answer is when, where, and for how long will how many chargements be available? Very simple. There's two ways to think about it. There's something that I can call a midterm prediction, where you're lying in bed and you want to take a car ride days, weeks into the future. So you don't care about the current situation. You want to know, if I go next Friday, when should I go? Which charging station should I go to? That's midterm prediction. Then there's short-term prediction. You're, on, you're in the car. You want to go from Hamburg to Munich, and you want to do that as quickly as possible. So you very much care about um, current utilization and current traffic patterns. And before we go into machine learning, um, because that's what people sometimes tend to do to make things very complicated very quickly, I just really want to emphasize that statistical approaches also work. So for rough planning, for simple ideas like the ones that I've presented before, these simple statistics are really useful. That's what Google Maps is doing. If you look at Google Maps and it shows you like, hey, this place is going to be busy, then they are essentially doing what we've done before. But they're looking at the typical or average Tuesday. Um, so if you just need that, if you need those simple ideas, Go for simple statistics. Don't bother with machine learning. It's too complicated. Also, if you are on the road and you have an hour till you reach a charging station, and that is a fast charger, and you want to know, like, hey, there's somebody charging there at the moment. Will that person still be there in an hour? Probably not. You don't need a machine learning to tell you that if everybody only stays for half an hour, that that person will be gone. It doesn't tell you if somebody else will have come in the meantime, but it does tell you that that person will have left, definitely. Right, so the simple statistics work in many cases, but they don't always work. And um, there's a few cases where we need more accuracy or more predictive power. And I wanna, and, and what I used for that is something called an ensemble learner. Now, most people, if they think about machine learning, will immediately think about neural networks. I will, I promise, I will use the term neural networks once in this presentation uh, later on, uh, but we'll start with ensemble learners. Why do we use them? Um, ensemble learners have a nice property. Because ensemble learners are built from small models. And those small models, in our case, are decision trees. Um, and you could, ask a you could ask the model, like, hey, I have a charging station. I want to go there. Then you would say, like, is it weekend? And they would say, yes, it's going to be a weekend. And then you'd say, like, hey, is it sunny? And then the, you would say, yes, it's sunny. And then you'd be like, OK, and we're in an area where a lot of recreational activities happen. And you're like, oh, it's weekend, it's sunny, and recreational activity. Great, it's going to be occupied. That's what a decision tree does. Um, the problem is that this logic is very rough. It's not able to capture a high level of complexity. The thing is, if you take your training data set and split it up into different chunks, make many, many, many of those, you end up with something called an ensemble learner. Um, and it's called a random forest. It's sort of the classical one. The word forest and tree is not coincidence in this case. And essentially what you do is you take those trees and count them. So if I ask the random forest now, is my charging station going to be occupied? Then in this case, in very simplified, four out of six trees will have said no. So if I would have to make a decision, i.e. something like a classification problem, 
um, then I would say the majority says no, so I'll go for no. Um, then, but I can also do something, and that's, that part isn't special. What I can do, also do is something more regression-like, because I have four vote, no votes and two yes votes, so I'll say no, but with a chance of yes. And the reason why this is helpful is clear if we think about it in slightly different terms. So what I've just described is gives you almost a certainty of vote. And that, if you compare that to a weather app, in your weather app, if you look at the precipitation, are you rain, um, you'll see that it gives you a percentage. And for a certain point on the map, if you look at that percentage, that is the probability that it's going to rain in the specified time period, um, in the, yeah, well, given your, your prediction. And that's what we can do with these models. So we just count the number of trees. In this case, two-thirds would say it's going to rain. Um, or sorry, two-thirds, and the top one would say it's not going to rain, one-third would say it's going to rain, and the bottom one uh, would have 100% rain, chance of rain. And then there's a, something else, uh, which is the regression model. Um, again, the weather analogy, uh, if, I say, if I ask the question, how much is it going to rain, that's the second information that you have on your weather app, um, then it will tell you a number. And that number can have different appearances if you look under the hood. Um, so in those two bottom bits that you see here, uh, you both have three drops on six clouds. So on average, you have half a drop per cloud. The thing is, it makes a huge difference if you have the top scenario, where you have low probability but very strong effects. Um, in that case, you want to prepare for flooding, but you'll probably be fine. In the bottom one, you have high probability, low effect, uh, or weak effect. Uh, in this case, bring an umbrella, but don't worry about flooding. All right, so this was the weather. We can transfer these ideas to charging stations. Um, and if we do that, uh, we can do something called a random forest, in this case, without site information. So we give the model, here is vacation days, public holidays, weather, nearby traffic, whatever we can find. We give that to the model and say, like, here's your training data, here's your input, output, go wild. And what we get is a model with an accuracy of 79%. And you could say, like, hey, great, 79%, that's pretty awesome. Um, the problem is, you will get to almost the exact same result if you always say it's available. You will also be right about 80% of the time, simply because charging stations are not used that much. If you always say it's not going to be used, you'll be right about 80% of the time. And that's exactly what that model is doing. And a way to measure this is something called the Matthews choice coefficient. Um, that one ranges between 1, 0, and minus 1. 0 means no predictive value, like the one I just described. 1 means uh, perfect prediction. Minus 1 means you always say the opposite of reality. Um, so MCC 0.019 no predictive value whatsoever. All right, simple statistics. I said they're useful. So what do we do? If we ask the simple statistics in this case, um, is, it, is the likelihood that it's going to be occupied more than 50%? Um, then we already get to an accuracy of 88% and an MCC of 0.6. Good. Not bad. And as I said, for most applications, reasonable enough. If, now, there's a trick that we can do because we want to do machine learning. Um, if we combine those two. So instead of just asking the model, hey, here is all the information that I could find about this charging station, please tell me what is happening. Um, we now tell the model, here is what's typically going to happen, but it's also maybe a holiday, public holiday. So the model would then say, okay, usually it would be occupied, but I'm in an industrial area and it's public holiday, so probably not in this case. And it's just going to correct for this simple statistics. And if we do that, we get an accuracy of 95%, we get an MCC of 0.838, um, and that's a really good value, the best one that I could achieve. There's also the other version that I mentioned, the short-term prediction, and there's something that we do, something called tree counting. So remember, we have many trees in a random forest, and imagine a situation where somebody has arrived 10 minutes ago and at a charging station, and you are going to be there in 10 minutes, and you want to know whether that person is still going to be there. And so what you ask your tra trees to predict is, how long is that person going to stay? And then what you do is you compare the number of trees um, that said yes or no. And what do you compare? You compare the ones, or you first you start with ignoring ones, because some trees will say, that person is only going to stay five minutes, but you already, that person has already stayed 10 minutes, so you know that those models were wrong. So you can exclude those. So all the trees that said they, the person is going to stay shorter than they actually did, take them out. So you're left with the ones that, at least at the moment, are still correct, and you then do the ratio for in, uh, in 10 minutes. 
And in this case, in the simple example, that would be 2 over 4, so 50%. But you can take this idea, the same idea, and apply it to um, much, you know, much more diverse data sets. But the idea here is very similar. In this case, you would then just divide 5% of the trees by just under 80% of the trees, and you would get a prediction. The beauty of this model is you don't need to retrain. Uh, you, you need one single model, and you can do sort of continuous estimation, uh, which is something that's very helpful. If you do that, um, you get a huge benefit because at the start of the event, what, the, what such a model will do, it will tell you the most likely event. And the most likely is typically short. So most of the people stay for a short period of time. So if you look at the error of the then training and test set, you'll see that you're making errors a lot and you're making positive errors because if you're wrong, you're most of the time wrong because somebody stayed longer than you expected them to. If you then apply this idea of tree counting, and you're somewhere during the charging event, in this case, after half the event duration, that error tends to reduce a lot because you're able to incorporate this information of how long the person already stayed. All right. And for the last few minutes, a few words on station placement. Because I said, the third question is, if we build new stuff, where should we build it? And there's two, again, two ways to think about it. One is on-road charging, and one is destination charging. On-road charging is the situation where I'm going from Hamburg to Munich, I want to charge on the way. The thing is, for machine learning models, this is a challenging situation because you essentially you have this huge traffic model. You, you want to know where, who's going from where to when, who's moving at which speed, etc. Um, so you need a very large visibility of what's happening in traffic to be able to do something about it. And that's definitely possible with machine learning, but uh, definitely not possible with the amount of with the data that I had um, that didn't work. So. That one's out, but what we can do is destination charging. Destination charging is I want, I'm going to somewhere and I want to know, is like, and, and I, I'm going to that place for a specific purpose. So if I go, say, to the theater and I watch the play, I am going there because there's the theater, not because there's the charging station. Whereas in the first case, I'm going there because there's the charging station. So in the destination charging, the environment of a charging station matters for how it's used. It makes, it makes a difference for how long people stay, for when people come, etc. And we can utilize that, um, and we can use a regression model um, to relate the charging station utilization to its environment. And you can, you can use a, a large variety of regression models, um, freedom of choice here. Um, as training data, or as feature data, we use OpenStreetMap points of interest. Um, so that's just points on the map where it says, like, here's this kind of building. And if you do that, as I said, we'll, we'll run through, very briefly run through a few um, models. You can do a linear regression. Linear regressions are useful because they give you insight. They are completely useless in terms of predictive power uh, because they assume independent linear uh, effects of the different points of interest, and that's just not what we have um, in this case. So we do get a bit of understanding. For instance, we can say uh, bars, pubs, and clubs um, have a very positive effect because they tend to be in areas where a lot of people go. You typically have diverse utilization because some people be, will be in the afternoon in cafes and some people will be in the evening, ideally not drinking if they're driving. Um, but you, so th this is a marker of an area that is very, has a heterogeneous user group and that means more charging events. A uh, football stadium, um, on the other hand, is a terrible place to build a charging station. Why is it a terrible place? If you have the simplest of um, all utilization patterns, you will have one home game every two weeks. If you have, and then you'll have a lot of people, but if it doesn't matter if you have 70,000 people there, if they only come once every two weeks, you're not going to get a lot of, whole lot of charging there. Um, so stadiums are terrible places for uh, charging infrastructure, unless obviously you have many events happening there um, all the time. But if you have just, in, like in this case, a single user group challenging for the business case. Now, I said before that linear models have the problem that they are linear and that they can't capture complexity. Uh, a way to deal with that would be polynomial fits. Um, so you just take a polynomial equation. Problem is they are too good. Um, they learn the data about too well and then create a huge um, error. Uh, there's a famous von Neumann quote which says, if you give me four parameters, I can fit you an elephant. If you give me five, I'll make it wiggle its tail. Um, so that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, the model is learning uh, the situation by heart. It's what we call overfitting. And now is the moment for neural networks. Um, so I said I will use them once. Uh, neural networks are good in this particular aspect because they have the ability to capture complexity 
Um, you can tune how much they overfit or underfit. Um, we found a setting, for instance, in this case, where we used two layers, 64 neurons, um, but that was sort of just a grid search. You can probably get to better results here. Nevertheless, they're good at this. Right. And that's uh, almost about it. Uh, we'll just draw a few conclusions. So these are where the three questions, just for your memory, that I posted in the beginning. Uh, how they're used, how can we predict utilization, and where should we put new stuff? And there's a few things that we've learned. So, um, how are stations currently used? Um, we've seen that uh, AC charging stations require subsidy to be profitable. Um, we've seen that the utilization is highly inhomogeneous. We have low utilization at certain times and uh, certain locations. That's what we would ideally like to change. Um, and we've also seen that the energy transfer at AC charging stations is not what it could be, given what we see on the DC charging stations. If we look at their utilization, um, we've seen that simple statistics work for rough planning. So they're good in many applications, um, but they don't quite work if you need high, level of, high levels of complexity and high levels of detail. Um, if we merge those two, we get a really good model, 95% accuracy, MCC 0.838, and we can predict duration of stay using the tree counting idea. And if we look at where should we put new stuff, um, for on-road charging, I would argue you need traffic models, um, but if we do destination charging, I would argue machine learning approaches work very well because we have the data to do that, and if we do that, we'll probably should use neural networks because they are able to c capture complexity. That was it. I would like to thank you for your attention. Before I finish, though, I'll give you one little toy to play with. Um, so this one's optimized for computers, so it works on the phones, but not very well. Um, hopefully, you should have the link in the chat soon as well of that, um, of that map. But here's a very visual example of uh, what you can do with these tools. Um, if you open that website, if you wait a bit, it's going to load for a few seconds you will see um, how these maps that we generated with the neural networks look like and how you can interact with them. If it's getting over, this is the first time that we tested with that many people, so if it's very slow, maybe try again in two hours, then our server will be overloaded. All right, that was it. Thank you very much for your attention, and thank you for having me.